Welcome back after the break. We're going to start straight away. So if you could just move silently to your chairs. We're trying to make the most of the limited time we have. I'd like to introduce Dr Linda Broadhurst uh, and thank Linda for uh, contributing today. Linda is Director of the Centre for Australian National Biodiversity Research uh, as well as the um, Director of the Australian National Herbarium at uh, CSIRO's National Research Collection Australia. So she's the head honcho in those situations in Canberra. Um, uh, Linda has been working at CSIRO for about 18 years so uh, we're very fortunate to have her because she actually um, specialises in researching um, uh, uh, the conservation and um, restoration of Australia's unique floral biodiversity but it's specifically related to genetic uh, matters that enable long-term uh, viability and improve long-term prospects. And that work has, uh, in particular, I've been more familiar with, with Linda's work, assisting uh, natural resource management groups and not-for-profits, including Green Australia and Landcare, in uh, getting a grip on the relationship between genetics and uh, seed sourcing for um, long-term viability of the ecosystems that we restore. So. I welcome Linda to the stage. Thank you. Um, thanks, Teen, and uh, I want to thank the organisers for the opportunity to talk to you. And um, I implore you not to turn off because I've got the word genetics in my title. Um, I know it sounds complicated, but if you try and think of it as one more thing that you can add to your toolbox to improve restoration success, I feel like I might have achieved something by the end of the talk. Um, so I just wanted to give some context. You all know this, um, but we are on one of the mega diverse continents of Australia, you know, estimates of about 70% of the, the species here only found here. So that is a huge responsibility for us to ensure that not only that we maintain and restore these species for our own benefit, but in the global context as well. Um, there's also been this long-standing recognition of degradation across Australia. It was uh, in the 1940s, you know, there was already some rumblings about uh, land degradation. We didn't really get some action on that till the 70s and then in the sort of late 80s um, National Land Care Program came into being and, and we've been working with that ever since. Um, and I just wanted to note, uh, the National Land Care Program is an in interesting juxtaposition between um, two allies that you wouldn't normally see coming together but clearly there was a common purpose and, and they could see that there was a common problem and that was the National Farmers Federation and the Australian Conservation Council. And at that time, some of us are old enough to remember, there was a real strong political and social will to actually do something about um, restoring biodiversity and managing what we had in a better way. And so investment started coming in, and some of that investment came in quite fast and quite hard. Um, and it still continues today, although, you know, as you can see, it fluctuates about how much actually gets invested in, and into what programs and what priorities. Um, but one of the things I did uh, a couple of years ago was to look at from, from the data we could gather from the NHT investment, how much actual activity we got out of that on the ground. And um, there's about one and a half million hectares of native veg works, and that's open to interpretation what that actually means. Um, and in effect, what happened there was about a quarter of Tasmania got worked on. And you, then you need to distribute that across the country to see the effect of what we got out of that part of the investment. Um, we protected another 4 million hectares from erosion, and that's about 65% the area of Tasmania, again, distributed across the continent. And then the bit that I was most interested in was um, how much went into reveg, and it's really tiny. Really, really tiny. And for those of you that don't know your maps very well, that's the ACT, and it's about 77% of the ACT actually went under Reveg Works through that program. Now, since that time, the figures are really hard to get hold of, and I'm not being able to do that over the whole of the programs up to this date. Um, but it's certainly something that would be interesting in terms of a national audit of actually what are the, the values that we've achieved out of all these programs. Um, but the interesting thing was of, of that 
part that went under reveg, you know, 63 million seedlings were planted at least. Now that's hundreds of thousands of seeds that were actually collected and used in that, that, that program. And there are some tonnages of, of what went into that actual um, program as well that, that are in a paper that I can point you to. So, um, it's also no surprise to this audience that we've had substantial changes to um, vegetation across Australia and, and the top map is uh, modelled pre-European vegetation. The bottom map is quite old, it's 2006, um, but you can see the white patches are basically where we've lost vegetation. And so we've not only altered vegetation abundance, we've altered its distribution. And in those white patches you can imagine that's a loss of genetic diversity. That's diversity that's gone or substantially reduced, that we don't have any more to work with. Um, and we've done that uh, through creating lots of small isolated populations in those areas as well. Now for plants that's incredibly complex because they can't move. They're totally reliant on something else moving their genes around the environment. So that might be an abiotic or a biotic vector. Um, there are a small number of plants that don't care about having their genes moved around, but the majority of ones do. Um, and that sets up an, an increased risk of inbreeding. And that's what I want to talk you through, how plants respond to this um, increased risk of inbreeding and how that might impact on um, seed viability or seed availability in terms of restoration. And of course, we've got ongoing impacts. Um, you know, the latest State of the Environment report highlights again ongoing decline. So despite all the investment, we're still not getting above the line in terms of decline. And then increasingly, we're about to have some of our strongest selection events ever happen in the age of the Anthropocene, you know, because climate change is here. There's no, I always thought that it wouldn't happen in my lifetime, but I've actually revisited that recently and I, you can see that it's actually here. There's no use trying to deny it anymore. Um, so inbreeding and fragmentation, the reproductive strategy of a plant influences how it will uh, respond in a fragmented system. And so I'm going to talk through um, three sorts of mechanisms for reproductive biology. So selfing, so where primarily um, plants self-pollinate, produce their own seed. Um, outcrossing plants where they um, have seed, uh, sorry, pollen come from another plant. And then a lot of plants actually do mix, so they'll, um, they'll do selfing if they have to, they'll do outcrossing um, if they have to. And in fragmented systems, what we often do is push plants towards one of those selfing or outcrossing systems, and that can really have major effects. And so um, if you're a self-compatible self plant like this Swain Sona, in a fragmented system and a small population, you still produce seed because you can self-pollinate, basically. And this is some work that um, Leila Boozer did uh, several years ago now, um, and she actually took seed from a range of populations that had different levels of inbreeding, and then she grew that seed both in and outside a glasshouse, because inside a glasshouse, very buffered environment. Um, and what this data is actually telling us is that um, she did two measurements, so 94 days and 141 days, and these are the levels of inbreeding, so the, the least inbred is the white going down to the most inbred, which is the hatched, and what you can see is the most inbred performs poorly under every circumstance. So in a glass house, you still get some growth, but they, they just fail to survive outside, which is the environment that you're putting the seed into for restoration. And that's primarily because the seed look like this. So if you have an inbred seed, you often are producing plants that look like this. And if you have outbred seed, you're producing plants that look like this. The challenge is both seed look the same when you've collected it from a plant primarily. Sometimes there's a slight difference in size, but if you're out there racing around the environment collecting seed, who's actually sitting there looking at it going, oh, this seed's slightly bigger than this seed? It's an impossible task to ask people to do. So that impacts um, in terms of restoration because you could end up with failure but not understand why. You might look for reasons beyond genetic diversity as the reason for failure and go down rabbit holes looking for um, explanations when the reality is that the seed was not actually of the quality you required for your restoration project. 
And it's a really interesting conundrum to me that... So one of my roles is um, I'm the group leader for the Australian Tree Seed Centre and they commercially sell acacia and eucalypt seed overseas and within Australia. We would not sell one of those batches of seed without a germination test. And yet we come quite cavalier when it comes to public money about buying seed but not asking for the quality of that seed. And I think, you know, it's really exciting that we are going to try and grow this restoration economy and that will hopefully stimulate some of these business practices that we must instil so that we're actually making that investment up front because we don't ever count the cost of failure. You know, we just go, oh, it failed. But we don't ever count the cost of that. So it's really important, I think, for us to start um, in that restoration economy, start thinking about what are the business practices that we're going to instil in, in that economy up front. So what if you're a self-incompatible plant? And self-incompatibility is a great evolutionary mechanism to stop inbreeding. That's exactly what it's designed to do. And so um, if you look at the top figure here, if you can imagine this is a plant, the orange, big orange um, flower is a, a plant in a, in a large population. And if you imagine, um, if you're an orange plant, that means that you're related. All the orange plants are related to each other. And so this is a mechanism to stop you selfing, so you can't self-pollinate, but you also can't mate with any other orange plants in the population. That's exactly what the mechanism is designed to do, is to prevent that inbreeding effect. Now what happens in the small population, however, is that often seed will fall below a mother plant, and so you're actually surrounded by your relatives. And that's what the diagram in the bottom is showing you, is that this plant is in a sea of relatives and, and that reduces your mate availability. So there are far fewer plants in the population for you to mate with and so you actually produce much less seed. And I've put a little asterisk down there, unless selfed, because these systems can be a little bit leaky and occasionally you will get selfed seed come through these systems, but often that seed is incredibly poorly performing. And that's because the mechanism is um, developed to not inbreed. So in that case, um, we will use Rudidosis as an example. Um, and this is a, a great model system that's been worked on for nearly 20 years now. And you can see here in this um, first diagram, we, we talk about genetic diversity in this um, system as S allele diversity. And S allele is the gene that kind of modifies how um, pollen interacts on the stigma. So um, it's w that's where the interaction occurs. If you're related, you don't mate. If you're not related, you do mate. And it's driven by very few alleles. And um, this is one of the challenges when we talk about genetic diversity. There's neutral genetic diversity, which tells you a lot about population structure and, and levels of neutral genetic diversity. But for some plants, one gene or a couple of genes can have a major effect on how the diversity in that population works. So this is the example here. So um, population size, so increasing population size up to the right and the number of S alleles on this axis. And you can see in bigger populations, you have more S alleles. You've got more plants, hopefully you should have more S alleles. Doesn't always hold true, but that's in this system it, it has. What that does is means that you increase your um, mates, so your mate availability is really high when you've got lots of S alleles in the system. That means there's lots of those different colours that you can mate with. And then what that turns into is in big populations you actually produce lots of seed and in small populations where you have few S alleles you don't produce much seed at all. And so the implications for that are that in big populations of, of self-incompatible, um, you get high genetic diversity, you actually get more seeds so you can plant more sites, and there's an increased likelihood that you are creating a diverse population with lots of mating types that's going to persist into the future. If you go with a small population, you will already have less seed to work with. Um, you've got low genetic diversity, especially for these in terms of their S alleles. That means you can plant fewer sites and then you're also reducing the likelihood of your long-term persistence. You're kind of creating another inbreeding population, which is the opposite of what you're trying to do with genetic diversity and restoration. 
So what about um, the ultimate self-incompatibility system, which is dioecious species, where you've got males and females on separate plants? You can't, they can't self-pollinate. Um, and this is some work with um, Alocasiorina um, verticillata, and we're just trying to understand how these species work in fragmented systems. Um, and our hypothesis for part of the study was that it's wind-pollinated, so the two closest males should do most of the pollinating. And, and the result we got was completely not that, <laughs> interestingly enough. Um, and so these pie charts are for um, the sites. So we chose small, linear, patch and restored sites. We were trying to check how the restored sites were tracking back towards hopefully a patch site. Um, and so the colours represent the, in the white are the two closest males that we sampled. Um, the grey are other males that were sampled in the system that we were looking at. And then the, um, the black are the ones that we assumed were other males in the system that we hadn't sampled. And so what I really want you to look at is these two here, which are the more natural systems that we work with. Um, that they're the processes that we're trying to reinstate in terms of restoration. And you can see that the two closest males, depending on the patch, often didn't do the bulk of it. It was other males, not the two closest, that were doing a lot of the pollinating. And so this suggests that there's some sort of mechanism to screen out that um, closest male pollen because potentially they're related. So again, even though these are wind dispersed, um, wind dispersal seed actually doesn't travel very far. Most of the seed falls still close to the mother plant. Those males are probably related to the female plant and so somehow she's excluding their pollen um, and, and preferentially accepting pollen from other males that we didn't sample. The challenge here, though, is in the restored sites um, that it's actually um, closest males are starting to increase the amount of pollination they're doing. So these systems aren't hard and fast. You know, if plants are forced to set seed, they will set seed. And I think the take-home message that, um, from here is that just because a dad sires a seed doesn't make him a good dad. And that works in any system, you know? I think we all know examples where that, that's a rule for life. Um, and that's one of the challenges is for us to understand uh, how these things operate. So interestingly, when we grew those seed, we actually found that the only effects um, so we're still analysing the seed set, but when we actually germinate and grow the seed from these, um, these mothers with the various elements of male pollination, um, the only effect we actually get is with seed weight and there's a bit of an effect for germination. So um, smaller populations have smaller seed and they grow a, a little bit slower. But in terms of all the other parameters that we've measured, there's no difference at all. So we think that there's some sort of um, early acting effect that actually all those seed die, all the poor seed die early in the experiment, and so all the good seed are left for us to measure, basically. So that's good in terms of um, restoration, if you think about it, because all your dead seed, or your poor seed die early, except if that's all the seed you've used, then everything is dead. Uh, so the final thing I want to talk about was um, some work by Colin Yates um, in WA, because this is, was to this point quite East-centric. Um, and this was a study that we'd done as a cross-biome study. So in WA we did uh, the same study on, on a couple of species as we did in the East, and this is the, the West Australian example. And this is um, a Calathamnus that has a mixed mating system, so it will self or outcross. Um, and basically we get the same relationship of um, you know, small populations produce less seed than large populations. But it, unlike um, the Swainsona, the small p, the growth effects are actually um, not, you don't get that small populations have actually poor growth. And again, um, we think this is maybe a genetic mechanism where um, in the paper I've quoted this post-zygotic elimination of genetically incompetent homozygous embryos and I thought I'm going to interpret that as the crap seed's dead, basically. <laughs> so again, that's a similar effect in that if you're using these small populations, 
you're not getting the restoration outcome that you would really like, basically, because you know they are all dying at that very early stage. And you might be ascribing that to, um, you know, we had damping off, we didn't do the weed control correctly, we had too many nutrients, or it could be the seed quality. And that's the thing that we need to actually build in early into restoration projects about what is the seed quality um, for that project. Um, so one of the things I've been very keen on recently was to actually start doing a bit of an audit of restoration, a genetic audit of restoration sites. And so this was some work we did with Greening Australia on um, some of their yellow box sites around Canberra. And these were planted um, from about the late 1980s onwards. And what we did here was um, we looked at genetic diversity in the restored trees. Um, in the seed from those restored trees, and I'm particularly interested in that because that's the next generation. You know, these are very long-lived species, 400 years. And so what is that next generation potentially going to look like? Um, so I'm very curious about that. And then also, you know, they were planted amongst scattered trees. And scattered trees are a, a phenomenon in the Australian landscape that's dropping out rapidly. And so I was very curious to, to compare the genetic diversity in these three different types of um, plantings. And each of the five sites responded identically. So I've collated the data together to give you a good idea of what's happening at that landscape level. And these are two measures of genetic diversity that population geneticists like. Um, I won't bore you with the details except to say that this one is expected heterozygosity and population geneticists like this one because it's related to fitness. It's often associated with high fitness. The higher this measure is, the more fit plants can be. And so what these two measures are telling us is exactly the same thing as the, the scattered trees, of which there are often fewer in the landscape, actually had higher genetic diversity than what's been restored into the landscape or what that restored um, cohort is actually producing in terms of seed. So that is a challenge because we know globally scattered trees are falling out of all systems. So you can go to the Dehesa, you can go to the Oaklands, it's the same story. Um, scattered trees are in serious decline. And so that means that we've actually shifted the genetic diversity in that landscape down over the next 150 years, unless we make some more intervention actions. And that, I think, is really disturbing because um, we haven't secured or improved the genetic base of this landscape to any significant effect. And the implication more broadly than that is, what does that mean for every planting that we've done over the last 20 years? You know, that we really need to think more carefully about are those actual investments we've already made going to persist into this very long-term future? And so um, just to summarise all that, I wanted to just challenge your assumptions about seed. And so you know, some of the things we talk about is it's plentiful. And we know that's not true. It's very erratic. It's often environmentally driven. You know, we're about to go into our second drought in not a very long time in Eastern Australia. Um, it's largely unavailable for all of the key species and groups that we want to restore. You know, we are primarily limited to a very small number of species. Um, that leads to things like species substitution and it also leads to this low species diversity. You know, we, we feel really happy when we can get 20 or 30 species direct seeded. Well, if you think of a, a box woodland, that's got 300 species in it. And sure, that's in a succession, you know, they don't all come in at once. But what we're not really sure about is whether those 20 to 30 that we're putting in are the ones we really want in to create that successional process. Um, the other assumption um, is that seed is always available and it's just not, you know. If I ask for seed of a particular species this year, I might have to wait two years for it. And the time to, um, for planning that lead in to get the seed that you need is often not built into, um, into programs. And that's where the, the OEH SOS program is actually visionary in giving people time to do that sort of proper planning into projects. Um, we also assume that any seed batch you get has got 
the right amount of genetic diversity. And we know that you know, inbreeding low diversity exists in fragmented systems. We know that that impacts on future generations. And we know that that's likely to impact on our ability to cope with change. And I went to Melinda Pickup's talk last night, this afternoon, and she, she said something that I think really resonated with me. Um, genetic diversity is the fuel of evolution. And we are going into these very severe selection events we need this diversity for selection to act on. And so this is my first cut at trying to understand how these things all interact. And I must say, I'm not particularly good at doing these diagrams because I'm, I'm not an ecologist. I think ecologists are very good at making diagrams. I'm a geneticist, so I'm not very good. Um, but this is my way of trying to summarise what I've been trying to tell you about how this is an interactive process. And then a couple of years ago, some friends and I started thinking about, so where's climate change going to impact on this process? Pretty much everywhere. So, you know, we really are starting to think about, um, you know, how are we going to build the seed banks of the future? How are we going to use the seed more efficiently for the future? And how are we actually going to think about when we need to be planting and how often? And we've been talks around that um, over the, the conference so far, which is um, fantastic to see. Um, so I haven't had time to talk about provenance, but it's, it's a big issue. Uh, you know, what is local? Should we be even using local? We've had some talks around that. And so what I wanted to now in the last four, four minutes um, is to talk about PERI and the national guidelines for exper experimental restoration plantings. And um, I've underlined some of these um, authors who are in the audience today. So um, if you want to talk to someone, there is a, a range of people you can talk to about this. Um, so we've had 25 years of investment, we've had some big investment, and we've had some positive outcomes. You know, we're often very hard on ourselves saying, oh God, we're doing such a terrible job. We've actually had some good wins in the restoration sector, and we should all pat ourselves on the back for that. But there are key challenges and there are key blockers, you know. So there's an, an increased desire to quantify ecological outcomes. There's limited ability to learn at scale. There are new pressures and opportunities. Um, this limited documentation for our activities, um, how we monitor, you know, we've seen talks about that, and there's the mismatch between short-term funding and long-term timeframes. Um, so we've come up with this concept um, called PERI, a platform for ecological restoration research infrastructure, um, and it's built, built on the premise that, you know, big data is here. We need to now be creating the big data sets for restoration. And so what we would like to do is build a coordinated, nationally distributed network of embedded ecological restoration experiments. And these are to answer key national ecological questions. And ecology is in the broader sense here, so it could be anything from tree planting systems to um, fire and grazing management. It could be any question you like, but we want to do this in a very um, sort of constructive and strategic way. Why? We've got, it's already happening. Every time a program of environmental um, sort of restoration or uh, management occurs, we have hundreds of thousands of experiments go across Australia. What we're not doing is capturing those experimental experiments in a very strategic way and we're not learning from them beyond the local level. Sometimes we can scale up to regional outcomes, but mostly it's local. Um, there's also great power in distributed networks of science, and a nutrient network is a great example of this. Started out exactly the same as this. A group of researchers decided to do it. It's gone global. So there are lots of reasons why we want to do it. How is kind of this is where we've got to so far? So we'd have you know a range of big questions that would go across eco different ecosystems, and ecosystems could be in or out depending on the question. Um, we'd have uh, experimental leaders leading those questions. We'd have an advisory board, and then we'd have an oversight and data management um, committee as well. So this is the model that we're thinking about at the moment, and um, potentially we're about to start inviting people to participate in this. So you may get an invitation from us to be on one of those levels at some point. Um, if we're going to do that, we need guidelines. And so last year, we actually kicked off with a, um, a workshop funded by National Land Care um, to develop the guidelines. This is where we've got to. Blue stars mean guidelines are well advanced. 
uh, white stars mean they're in progress. And we're doing a lot of community building and I want to signal that next year we're probably going to start rolling out some workshops around this and there's a discussion paper out, comments are welcome and there are too many people to thank so I'm just going to say these are the organisations that are, have been participating. Thank you. I'm fine. Thank you very much, Linda. That's terrific. We actually really don't have time for questions, I'm afraid. Um, but I'd like you to uh, corral Linda at the break and perhaps uh, uh, see if, if she can answer any of your questions. I'd like now to in introduce uh, Dr. Paul Gibson-Roy. Uh, Paul has been with Greening Australia for the last 20 years. Uh, he has been, for longer than that, involved in grassy ecosystem uh, restoration, particularly the direct seeding of uh, herbaceous layers uh, in Victoria and now New South Wales, and that obviously involves uh, seed production as well. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, team. Um, I have a story that I really want to tell uh, our sector. Uh, it's almost become a compulsion and uh, whether people accept or reject what I have to say is sort of, I guess, up for them to decide. Today I've been given the opportunity and the honour uh, of being able to um, share this story with you and for that I'm extremely grateful. I have chosen, perhaps incredibly stupidly, not to use a single image in this presentation and anyone who knows me will know that that is not my usual style. So I do this, um, and I, I, this morning I've, I respectfully ask that you uh, instead lend me your ear uh, to consider these words and lend me your mind's eye to paint the landscapes I describe with justice. My story starts here in Australia. Our country, as you know, is a significant world in food and fibre producer with a large ag agricultural footprint. And our agricultural success in a competitive global market has been achieved using an intensive production model. And this has come at considerable cost, not only to farmers and to rural communities, but to our natural environment. In 2016, livestock grazing on exotic pastures occupied 71 million hectares, while dryland cropping covered a further 27 million hectares. Irrigated crops, pastures, horticulture take up another 2 million hectares. To varying degrees, all these forms of agriculture exclude, replace or impact on native vegetation, as can extensive grazing of rangelands. And as a result, our native grassy ecosystems in southern temperate Australia are diminished to a tiny fraction of their original range and are among our most threatened plant communities. For many decades, protection has been the primary conservation tool to halt the loss of our native grassy ecosystems. The Federal e uh, Environmental, Environmental Protection Biodiversity Act, complemented by state-based state acts, have led to the protection of many grassy community types. However, as Linda pointed out, ecological assessments continue to reveal ongoing degradation and destruction. And this brings into question our wisdom, uh, the wisdom of an over-reliance on protection-focused environmental laws. And it highlights the need for a complementary approach to halt and reverse grassy ecosystem loss of which a prime candidate is surely ecological restoration. Now, ecological restoration embodies a wide range of beliefs and motivations, but broadly speaking, its goal is to restore or repair human-degraded native ecosystems. However, despite these seemingly benevolent goals, its validity is questioned by some who believe it capable only of creating pale imitations of nature. Others hold deeper objections, charging that the concept provides support for a human-centric worldview, that nature destroyed can simply be replaced by technology whenever and where, where we want. And this low concept in the core principle and in its application, particularly among researchers and practitioners, 
has the capacity to weaken government support for restoration of complex systems. And evidence of this may be inferred from the fact that governments on both sides have historically directed environmental funding towards low-risk restoration approaches, such as those that primarily focus on tree and shrub layers, in the hope that the ground lay will miraculously reappear. However, without appropriate support and incentive mechanisms, there can be no viable market for complex restoration in this country. This situation leads to seed and restoration sectors small, poorly resourced and practically incapable of undertaking complex restoration at the scale that is required. Now, I've been involved in grassy restoration in Australia for many years, and during that time, yes, there have been welcome small-scale successes, and these demonstrate that it is at least technically feasible to reconstruct grasslands and grassy woodlands in this country. This on-ground experience has also revealed many factors that restrict our capacity to restore these systems. And at the most fundamental level, complex ground layer restoration is limited by a lack of seed. There is simply not enough available in the quantities, diversity, quality and price to undertake restoration at scale. This limitation is not insurmountable if seed production approaches are employed nor are other factors of a technical and practical nature insurmountable, such as the need for suitable restoration infrastructure, equipment and methods, if there is a viable market to drive investment and innovation. So to determine if similar factors affected a grassy restoration in the United States, I travelled to that country in 2016 with the support of a Winston Churchill Fellowship, which I'm eternally grateful for. And there I set out to examine the new US seed and restoration sectors. I met and interviewed growers and restorationists. I toured seed farms and restoration sites to gauge the scale and complexity of these sectors and to contrast them with my Australian experience. I travelled extensively across a large area of the country during mid-spring so that I could visit crops and sites when they were active. This driving trip took me from Texas in the south to Minnesota in the north, and from New York State in the east to Oregon and California in the west. And that was done in an awesome Dodge Challenger. <laughs> My aim was to determine to what extent the practice of grassy ecosystem restoration was supported and practiced, and if so, what structures and systems were in place. And from that experience, I hope to be able to make uh, recommendations that could help our sector Seed production or seed farming or seed increase is viewed as a fundamental requirement to meet the seed needs for restoration markets in the agricultural landscapes of the US, where wild seed is often critically limited. And while researching uh, and preparing for my tour, it became clear that there are large numbers of organisations and enterprises in the US growing or selling native seed. Most are privately operated, some are government agencies, but all encompassed a wide variety of business models and production models. So shortly after arriving and beginning to uh, visit growers and restoration sites, I realised the state of these sectors was almost the opposite to that which I'd come to know in Australia. It was clear that the physical scale of native seed growing in the US was orders of magnitude larger than here in Australia. For, for example, in Australia, I know of no high-intensity native seed farms greater than 20 hectares in scale, and those this size only grow native grasses. In the US, I visited seed farms that were between 1,000 and 5,000 hectares in size, and these grew crops of hundreds of species of grasses and forbs. To me, the complexity of these enterprises told a clear tale Growers are willing and able to raise the capital required to start large-scale enterprises. And this is possible because viable markets exist for native seed. These markets create income streams that ensure investments are paid down, operating costs met and profits made. Again, an unfamiliar experience here in Australia. To grow native seed at scale requires significant amounts of infrastructure, equipment, and human capital. It requires unique levels of specialisation and knowledge, 
and it was clear from the farms I visited these things were abundant. I was shown through several multi-level buildings on any given farm, each devoted to different sets of activities such as admin, seed processing, seed packaging, seed distribution, seed storage, equipment storage and upkeep. I was shown vast arrays of equipment used for seeding, crop maintenance, seed harvest, seed cleaning, packaging, storage, testing and distribution. In the US I found it common for seed or restoration businesses to employ between 20 to 100 staff. These figures dwarf any operations I know in Australia. And in many instances, these business was, businesses were among the largest and most stable employers in their regions. I found it hard at that point to even dream of such a scenario here in Australia. I was taken to see many restored grasslands and grassy woodlands or savannas ranging in composition and complexity and structure depending on the goals and sources and degrees of funding. But all re represented effectively restored native vegetation. Some were small, less than 20 hectares. Others were vast, up to 5,000 hectares in size. Some used modest numbers of native grasses to create fodder or stabilise soils. And others installed hundreds of species to restore highly complex systems. Many included threatened species as subcomponents of overall programs to great effect. The fundamental techniques used to restore grassy communities in the US were not that dissimilar to what we do here in Australia. But because access to seed for restoration is not the issue that it is here in Australia, US restorationists could focus on preparation and planting techniques. And longer term management also focused on similar factors that we deal with, including controlling biomass, weeds, excess tree growth or overgrazing. However, again, the difference was that with many US restorations established with adequately funded programs, they had the planning and budgets to support long term management, wherever and whatever the challenges arose. This is contrary to our Australian experience, where support for long-term management is something that most managers of native grasslands and grassy woodlands accept as a given. In the end, what impressed me most about the seed growers and restorationists I met was their quite confidence in their ability to rebuild native vegetation. Even noting that some restorations failed to meet ex uh, expectations, these people had a firm belief and confidence in a sector that had the financial and on-ground resources to achieve scale, uh, success at scale. And this was demonstrated by most of the sites I visited. I was slightly envious of their confidence because in the absence of similar markets for restoration, I feel that this is not something will be a feature of the Australian sector for a foreseeable future. One of the most striking aspects of my tour was the realisation that there are several large independent markets that underpin this dynamic and successful sector. Reduced to broad categories, these are the federal and state-based farm-based conservation programs. There are federal and state-based native roadside programs. And then there are green urban infrastructure related programs. Everyone I interviewed and commented talked about the importance of farm-based agri-environmental programs as market drivers. And without question, the most prominent was the Conservation Reserve Program. This was signed into law by President Ronald Reagan as a provision of the Federal Food Security Act in 1985. It's administered by the USDA and it operates as a farm rental program in which the federal government operate, uh, rents or retires land, er erodible cropland, uh, such as corn or wheat or oats, and converts it into native vegetation, wildflowers, grasses, trees. The incentive for farmers to enrol in the CRP is that they receive annual rental payments for a contract period of 10 years, as well as half the cost of restoring the vegetation. So the farmers also contribute. And growers told me that the CRP payments are comparable to those that come from growing the agricultural crops. So farmers bid for CRP places on a national basis and the bids are assessed using an environmental benefits index. And this favours bids that have a higher environmental or biodiversity outcomes. The CRP has run for 30 years. 
three, at three ten-year cycles. And during that time, it has created the incentive, but the sector capacity to restore 9.7 million hectares of native vegetation. And that has occurred on 365,000 farms across America at an average rental payment of $29 per hectare. In doing so, the CRP has provided farmers with a fair price to farm native biota. It has helped create a viable and stable market for restoration and it's enabled it to develop formidable production and capacity. Nothing of this type of scale has occurred in Australia to date. There have been many research studies conducted to quantify the outcomes of this continental scale program. And important among them are those that have confirmed reversals in landscape fragmentation and reversals in regional declines in biodiversity. Other benefits have flowed. For example, improvements in farmer health and well-being. The USDA has estimated that CRP lands have achieved an average reduction in soil loss from 8.5 to zero, less than 0 0.8 tonnes per hectare per year. That's an amazing outcome given our importance of soil security here in Australian agriculture. Mitigation of greenhouse gases is another quantifiable effect of the CRP. And Tom Vislak, the US Secretary of Agriculture, reported that the CRP lands has sequestered 44.4 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions per year since 1985. And regarding water quality, something else we've spoken about during the conference, it's been reported that nitrogen and phosphorus runoff to waterways on CRP lands has been reduced by 95 and 85 per cent respectively. The USDA administers other farm-based conservation programs that complement the CRP, and examples are the Grassland Reserve Program, the Wetland Reserve Program, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, the Monarch Butterfly. This is amazing. These programs have been achieved through strong legislation and the development of coordinated policy frameworks. There are future challenges for the CRP and similar projects because there is uncertainty about the degree to which future administrations will continue to support farm bills. And there are also pressures in face of growing demand for increased agricultural production uh, from higher commodity prices. But despite these challenges, at the time of my tour, these farm rental programs were viewed by growers and restorationists as major market drivers. They also created the opportunity to utilise part of the agricultural landscape for conservation, and they allowed farmers to balance stewardship of nature with meeting their agricultural production and economic goals. There are over six million kilometres of roads spanning the continental US, and I drove uh, quite, <laughs> quite a way along them. And travelling north from Houston, Texas, to visit the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Centre in um, Austin, I noted regular long stretches of wildflowers blooming in profusion. And can, given their presence seemed to be intentional rather than as remnants, I just dared not believe they were native wildflowers, given such a thing would be unthinkable in Australia. And I commented on this experience, and I was informed, yes, these are Texan wildflower plantings. And I learnt this remarkable landscaping is not uncommon in that state, and more broadly across the US. And I saw similar roadsides in many of the states I visited. I learnt these programs are again a legacy of strong leadership and proactive legislation, which commenced in the 1960s. The roadside wildflower movement, imagine that was in large part initiated through the passion and advocacy of Lady Bird Johnson, who is the wife of former President Lyndon Johnson. And President Johnson, after much public advocacy and lobbying by his wife, introduced the Highway Beautification Act in 1965. And this was instrumental. It limited billboard signage and, 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 and reduced rubbish, but also directed funding to native landscaping on publicly funded roads. And this leadership from the highest level, set the stage for other native flora-friendly legislation from both federal and state governments. Important milestones were in 1987, in a program called the Surface Transportation Uniform Relocation Assistance Act, signed into law by Ronald Reagan. And that 
provided funding using 1% of the total highway budget to plant wildflowers. And again in 1994, in an act signed into law by President Clinton, established again clear directions to utilise native species on road sites. US road agencies now recognise that road corridors represent the largest pieces of continuous land for biodiversity habitat if they're planted in native vegetation. They also recognise that natives provide important functional roads on roadside, such as stabilisation and reducing ongoing maintenance costs. And there are a number of studies that confirm those outcomes. Beyond that, wildflower plantings are valued for their tourism potential, or wildflower tourism, it was called over there. And many states have established individual wildflower programs with the key goal of attracting tourists to their states. And so by making the vegetated spaces on the US road corridor available for natives, Americans have created a huge footprint for native biota. And the demand for seed and plants created by those programs have provided a huge impetus for the market. There are few similar initiatives in Australia, despite our almost 800,000 kilometre road system. And it, prevents a, it provides a potential blank canvas for the restoration of native herbaceous vegetation with all the associated benefits seen in the US. So in recent decades, this efficient, effective, innovative restoration sector has been able to develop and explore new markets. And one of the most prime markets is the urban market. So as a result, US landscape architects and city designers and planners are increasingly embracing the use of native ground layer species in their city designs. And in doing so, they're creating huge demand for plants and seed. I toured a, a number of nurseries, each of them producing millions of plants for their local urban footprint. And these, these partnerships often generate strong collaboration between growers and architectural teams and local communities. Many of these projects were, were for large organisations such as Walmart and Coca-Cola, and they you know, created landscape around their retail and offices, and others were for municipal councils and libraries and things like that. So the use of natives in urban landscapes was typically undertaken for functional and amenity reasons. But people also recognise these created opportunities for preserving native biota in the built environment. In Australia's cityscapes and infrastructure works, by contrast, there is very little integration of the native ground layer species, apart from the use of a small range of grasses and grass-like species. And this is primarily because seed and plants are seldom available from a broad range of species at prices that are competitive with equitable uh, exotic plants. This would not necessarily be the case if a large restoration ex sector existed here. I don't want to overly idolise the US situation, and certainly I don't suggest that all I learned of was perfect. I saw much, but by no means all facets of the sector. Many of the funding programs I've spoken about have limitations and strengths, and it's certain that some growers are more effective than others, and while many of the restorations are great successes, others fail. However, it is undeniable that remarkable things have been achieved in the US in relation to the restoration of grassy ecosystems. The Americans I met were believers. I was not exposed to the doubt that I commonly experience here in Australia, where questions such as why don't our restoration projects work are commonly debated topics at forums like the one we're at today. In Australia, we tend to doubt whether it's possible to restore diverse native landscapes, whereas in the US it was my impression that it's simply assumed that it can and should be done. Now, belief of this magnitude is a powerful catalyst for progress, and it's one that we sorely need. Decisive government action, as has been displayed in the US, will be critical if we are to move from the current situation of continued loss. Economists have argued that if governments create the right incentives, markets can achieve remarkable things. And that's what I think has occurred in the US. Appropriate legislation has created powerful incentives for farmers and other landscape managers to implement restoration on their land. 
And this huge market has fostered and enabled the US restoration sector to develop and eventually achieve remarkable things. Without government leadership, I find it hard to believe I would have found what I did. I suspect I would have found something that more resembled the situation we have here in Australia today. I believe we need prime ministers and premiers and government and ministers to take on a true leadership role in forming policy and legislation that supports the preservation of native species through restoration and conservation. Now, our, our leaders cannot be expected to have the background or knowledge to form grand visions if they are not informed and inspired by others. And for that task, we need passionate and articulate advocates from research and practice to inform and to guide and to challenge our leaders to use their positions to create transformative change. It will require researchers to focus less on publication output and more on adv advocacy. It will require practitioners to focus less on whose method is best practice and more on building our sector. None of this will be easy or straightforward, but it has been achieved in the United States. There is no technical reason why in Australia we must watch our native grassy ecosystems disappear forever. My own work has convinced me that they can re be, re be rebuilt on farms and on roadsides and in urban areas. Indeed, while I finalised a manuscript which described my, um, my US tour, I spent several weeks touring and monitoring old uh, grassland restorations that I undertook in Victoria, and most of these are now 15 years in age. And happily, <laughs> I found most comparable in quality and condition to the best grassland remnants I know of. And at the time, at the same time, I found precious remnants maddeningly degrading, seeming, seemingly through neglect and inertia. And standing as I did during these surveys in beautiful, resilient, functional, species-rich restorations, I found it hard to fathom why some in our sector are so resistant to the notion of redemption through restoration. Why does our sector not have the confidence to embrace these approaches? Why don't we offer farmers the incentives they need to return native grassy ecosystems to parts of their holdings? Why don't we expect our road agencies to replace roadsides covered in exotics with natives? Why is it that our native ground, flayer, uh, ground layer flora is not more commonly integrated into our urban landscapes? The feasibility and the benefits of all these actions have been demonstrated in the United States. Why not here? As a sector, I believe we must dispense with doubt and embrace belief. We can no longer afford to create the illusion of activity, as has been the case for decades, when there has been so little progress and so much loss. We must put our shoulders to the wheel, we must grow seed, we must restore complex red vegetation and create change for the good. We must stop fearing failure and where it occurs we learn and move forward. All this can be done. And meanwhile, across the Pacific, in the US, year on year, seemingly astronomical quantities of native seed and plants are distributed across the broad American landscape, creating an ever-increasing environment of diverse, functional, resilient native vegetation. Surely our goal must be to strive for a day when a similar thing could be said about Australia. Thank you.